Perfect. All right, welcome to the 200 levels. Um, this class is about application development and I've gone through so many different sales trainings. A lot of the times when I hear a sales training that's about something technical, I just think, oh great, there's this technical guy that's gonna talk about like, you know, technology and I can tune out, right? But I really wanna talk about the goal of this session. This goal is to have better conversations with developers, developer managers, and architects. So, um, and ultimately what I want y'all to get out of this session is the ability to speak their own language with confidence. Um, why is that important? Uh, so if y'all ever take the personas class, one of the things that I mentioned is that when you're speaking to technical people, if you can use their language, you're gonna have a much higher response rate. And so we're not really asking people to be essays, we're not asking people to be engineers, but like if you start using their language more and start talking about like, oh yeah, you know, your CI, CD, agile, blah, blah, blah stuff, um, I think that you're going to get a lot higher of a response rate in terms of your um, outreach. And also, I think that you're going to have better conversations. So the specific goals for this course are learn about the life of a developer. That's something that's really important. Understanding what they care about, what motivates them, and their emotions. Um, I think a lot of times we talk about what they're responsible for, but I want you to understand what it's like to be a developer. Cause you can, if you can better empathize with them, you're gonna be able to better have conversations with them. Obviously I want you to learn about their tools and workflow. That's really important. And the ultimate deliverable and the thing that I hope that y'all get out of this session is to once again, speak their language with confidence, which I think will move the dial for y'all. All right, so let's just jump right in, right? So before talking about what developers do, we have to talk about the businesses that they're a part of. Ultimately, it's all about applications. Why? Because the businesses that they work for, that's how they make money. Um, so businesses make money off of their applications and you need developers to create and maintain these applications, right? So what are the different types of applications that we have? Um, so we have things like web applications, that's like Netflix, you have iPhone applications, Android applications for your phone. And those are all primarily like entertainment, but now there's other categories tool, right? So you have tools like um, Excel and G Suite, you have games. And ultimately the reason why businesses care about these applications is that that's how they make their business run, right? So in a traditional like uh, regular business, like let's just say that this is like a family run, um, you know, establishment. So someone took out a huge business loan to get this establishment and they know that like, this is going to be their long-term source of family subsistence, right? So um, they probably spent hundreds of thousands of dollars into the store and business itself. And how they attract clients is basically whether or not this business survives or fails, right? So every single thing about this traditional brick and mortar store, it matters. Um, so they think about the color scheme, they think about the location. Um, what are some of the things that y'all see about this store? Like if you walk by it, like um, what's the emotions that it would create um, as you walked by it? Uh, looks cute. Exactly. Approachable, definitely looks inviting. If uh, it does look if, a little cluttered. Yeah. It does look a little cluttered, but if you were a child that was walking by the store, do you think that it would appeal to you? Oh yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, things that they think about is, what is my target population? Well, it's probably young families and children. So, how can I cater to that population? Just like that for a traditional business, like electronic business, like Amazon. Amazon actually spends millions of dollars every year hiring psychologists and sociologists and anthropologists. And they actually do incredible amounts of behavior studies on color schemes for their website, how to cater to each specific type of population. So in the United States, you have many different types of populations, right? You have educated populations, you have lower income populations, 
how can we create a website that's engaging for every type of population? And if you just think about it, the difference between this store having a colorful storefront and one that's a little bit plain, maybe 20% of sales, the difference in this store having like a good location in the middle of your town center and one that like, uh, you know, is, isn't, is, is a little bit further to get away of, then that could be whether your business survives or fails. So in terms of things like amazon.com, the ability to have an engaging and fun and intuitive website makes a difference between 20, 30% difference year over year compared to an average website. So there's tons of research and investment that goes into building out these websites and all of that takes developers, right? So that's ultimately what developers do is that they maintain these e-businesses and electronic applications. So how do you stand out? We're in a competitive marketplace. In technology, it's often a winner's take all market. And so what I mean by that is it's not like, you know, a town and you have enough of a population to support three hardware stores. In an e-business, usually one person wins out and everyone else gets kicked out. Um, so these are things that every VP and CTO that we talk to, they think about is what is my competitive advantage on every other business that's trying to do something similar to us. And the two ones that I wanna talk about really today are features and speed. These are things that developers think about all of the time. And fundamentally, when I was a developer, I worked on features basically almost all day. Um, other things is like, how do I stand out as my e-business? I wanna have my best virtual storefront. This is the reason why I hire all of these sociologists that go to University of Wisconsin, Berkeley, to study human nature and do have behavior studies is so that I can have the most interactive experience compared to my competitors. If I even have a 2% better website than someone else, then that's gonna result in billions of dollars for me year over year for something like Amazon. Just think about Uber versus Lyft. So these are two applications, they almost do the exact same thing. But if Uber had like some feature or it could do something that Lyft couldn't, over the next three year time horizon, how much of a market share is that going to make it for a difference? And ultimately it's all an arms race, right? So um, yeah, let's, let's just talk about some examples. So Amazon has gone up their revenue around three times in the last five years. So literally plus 300% in terms of revenue. And one of their fundamental strategies is to basically just be able to sell more and different things. So if you fast forward 10 years ago, they sold books. And as you know, time progressed, then they started selling household things. And then just look at the things that they've added in the last couple of years. So you can now get homemade crafts because they own Etsy. You can get groceries. They've made a ton of money off of groceries because of coronavirus, because they now own Whole Foods. They have their own video streaming service. So they own Prime Video. Um, I was using that this weekend. Um, but they even own, like in terms of the gaming market, Twitch is the most popular gaming platform right now, and they own it, right? So um, they're just expanding their business. And as they expand their business in terms of features, that's ultimately how they're able to drive revenue. Let's talk about speed next. So this is something that people don't think about, but it matters a lot. And there are tons of engineers that work for Amazon, Microsoft, Google, that basically they have master's degrees. They get paid $150,000, $200,000 a year to basically just optimize speed. So I'll just give you some statistics. Pinterest, which is some website, increased signups by 15% after it reduced their wait times by 40%. So I had an engineering investment into the speed of my website. I get 15% more customer um, engagement, right? So what's the cash value of that over a three year time horizon? British Broadcasting Corporation, which is, um, they found that they lost 10% of users for every additional second their site took to load. And this is a big problem for them because ultimately how they get money is through ad revenue, right? So if I'm losing 10% of users, that's 10% of my revenue stream. Google found that 53% of mobile website visits were abandoned if a site took longer than three seconds to load. So this is what engineers work on. This is what they're paid to do. 
is to optimize and build out applications to help out an electronic business. On the bottom over here is the annual financials for Amazon.com. As you can see, in 2015, they were at 100 bill. At 200, in 2019, they're at 300 bill, so literally 3x, right? And part of how they were to do this is because they were the best in terms of their competitive advantage. They figured out we, if we target X, Y, and Z versus our competition, we're going to win. And so they executed on the roadmap with this in terms of features. And then they also executed and maintained things like site responsive, like site, um, like responsiveness and things like that. So that's how ultimately they were able to win is by doubling down on their competitive advantage. So now that we have an understanding of what developers do, I'm going to start talking a little bit about um, the life of a developer. I'm going to tell some stories and I'm going to talk about some of the tools and the machinery that they do. So um, that they use. So like, once again, definitely pay attention to this um, because I really do believe that this is going to help y'all to have better and more engaging conversations with your technical audiences. So let's dive right in. Okay, programming languages. Applications are written in programming languages. Um, so ultimately what a programming language does is it just tells the machine to do something. That's all it does. And so there's different programming languages just like there's different languages like, you know, uh, so like if, if I wanna communicate that I'm hungry in English, I say I'm hungry, but if I wanna communicate that in Spanish, then, you know, I just say tengo hambre, which is fundamentally means the same thing, but the syntax is different. That's the exact same thing with programming languages. Fundamentally, they are all doing the same thing. Their intended purpose is to just tell machines to do something, but there's just a different syntax that they use. Um, it's important to know that some programming languages are used for different purposes in technology. So if I'm, if I'm working at MIT doing big data samples, I'm probably using Python. If I'm building websites, I'm probably using JavaScript. When you're a programmer, you really care about what programming language you are, you are investing in because it takes around five to 10 years to really get to know a programming language well. And some of these programming languages are disappearing in terms of their industry use. So if you just think about that, if I'm investing all of this time into getting better at something, if people stop using it, then my ability to take home bread for myself has basically dried up. So it's really important for developers to know that the tools that they are using on a database basis, that they are being more widely adopted in industry because ultimately that's gonna increase their market value. People basically, if you're an engineer, they think about the hottest, languages and trends and stuff and then they basically want to learn that stuff to increase their market value this is python um, this is what it looks like ultimately it's just telling machines to do stuff this is ruby um, this is actually gitlab code and gitlab is written in ruby um, my personal take on this and hopefully this doesn't get too much repeated is that gitlab would be better off if it were in python but that's just my personal opinion. So let's actually just do a demo now. Um, I think that sometimes things can get too abstract. So let me just uh, share my screen with you. And let me, um, let me know when you can see my desktop. It should just be uh, the background of my Mac. Oh, we can see it, or I can see it. <laughs> All right. So there's this big black thing over here. This is called a terminal. And um, I'm gonna show you basically what this little code thing that I made does, right? So if you're just gonna take a look at it, it says that like, um, it says to print some stuff, making directories and then so on and so forth. So let me just run this. And as I run this and hit enter, I want you to pay attention to what happens to my desktop. All right, so what happened? I think it's running a command, cleared it, cleared out those files. Yeah, so ultimately all this code snippet does is that it created a bunch of folders and then deleted them. Um, 
And the takeaway point with this is one, you might ask yourself the question of like, who cares, right? Like I can create a folder, right click, click new folder, but what happens and the power of programming languages is really how do I do things at scale in an automated manner? So let's just say I'm an engineer. I need to control 10,000 servers because they need to get updated or like, um, I have 10,000 like, you know, sensors for an electricity grid that's distributed across three states in the United States. So now with a programming language, I can go do that in an automated and scaled way as opposed to doing everything manually. Anything that you can do by right clicking and creating folders and stuff, you can do using this thing called a terminal. And ultimately what developers do is they write this code. Um, so over here, I just wanna bring this point home. So a lot of times I think that things can get really abstract. This is GitLab project itself. Fundamentally what GitLab is, is that it is a set of text files. Um, and over here, you can see these exact text files. If I go down into uh, this specific file over here, um, it's just text. So every single application, amazon.com, Google, uh, Netflix, fundamentally, literally everything that it is and its entire value is that it's a running set of text files. So um, it, it's just kind of interesting to think about. All right, so now that we have understand what programming languages are and what they're used for, um, we got to talk about libraries and dependencies. So this is a term that we hear from time to time. The reason why it's important is because GitLab actually houses dependencies. Um, it's one of this part of our value proposition. And what these are is that they're fundamentally prepackaged chunks of code that you can use. If you just think about it, um, a lot of developers are just doing the same thing over and over again, right? So to basically create a button, like a one single button in a website is probably around a hundred lines of code. And buttons are like pretty inter interchangeable all the time. You might wanna swap out the color, you wanna might wanna change the design somewhat, but you can basically like copy and paste this chunk of code, right? And so what a library or a dependency is, is it's, a, like a templated chunk of code that you can use so that you don't have to copy and paste and reuse that hundred lines of code over and over again. So um, basically what I mean by that is that there's libraries for creating buttons, there's libraries for creating charts. And the whole point of this is that someone's already invented the ability to do this. So as opposed to you building this out yourself, just use someone else's library. The vast majority of programmers, they specialize in just using a few popular libraries. So I'll give you an example of this. When I was an engineer, our, I was working on a website and our website used this thing called Django. And Django is basically something that's used to create APIs. People literally just had their entire careers using Django. And that's basically how they got paid. Um, another library that we use a lot is this thing called Selenium, and this is web automation. So it's like you can tell your browser to like go click on these buttons and do it in like a loop 10,000 times. That's what Selenium does. And so you can get jobs just using Selenium. The reason why this is important is that it's, a, it's just sort of like um, taking a step back. A lot of times when we look at a website, we just see this is a website, but beneath the hood, there's actually a bunch of different components that are working together. This is exactly the same as how, if you look at a car, you could look at it and see, this is a car. This is a Honda Accord 2009 edition LX, right? But to a trained eye, you know that there's engines, there's a transmission, everything. There's maybe, you know, a thousand different parts and they're all connected together. It's the same thing in technology. And in technology, instead of having like a transmission and an engine, we have things like databases and APIs and messaging queues and things like that. All of that stuff is connected together somehow and developers figure out, and developers and architects, they figure out which components to use and also how they're connected. So here's an example of just like how people get jobs off of these libraries. These are literally, um, you know, just a popularity of specific libraries for making buttons. And it's just four different frameworks that you can use for making like graphical elements for websites. 
if you're an engineer, you want to be in the top tier of these because once again, like you're investing all this time into learning something that's hard. And if it stops being used, so for instance, Ember down here, it's going down in popularity, right? Which means that all of a sudden, if I'm an engineer, my relative value is now decreasing. So something to think about. All right, let me, let me give you an example of this real quick. So this is my terminal. Um, can you uh, see like the black box? Yep. All right, great. So let's just say one of the things that we see in games all the time is simulating chance, right? So it's like, um, if I'm playing Hold'em online or something like that, I got to simulate chance and I could write out all of that code itself, or I could use a library that or ha is already built for this purpose. And that saves me a bunch of time. So the library for building out chance in Python is this thing called random. And as what you can do over here is you can generate random numbers. So I just generated a random number. I just generated another random number. Ultimately, what this library does is it saves me a bunch of time. I don't have to design all of this code to generate random numbers. I can just use someone else's stuff. And this is a in the future classes, I'm going to gloss over this a little bit, but this is one of the things that GitLab does, and it's part of the reason why we make money. So it's important to understand that this is the reason why developers want to understand about libraries and dependencies and how we're package managers and how we can like hold containers and things like that. All right, source control management. This is um, obviously GitLab is source control management. Once again, I just really want to reiterate this point that fundamentally every single application that we use is just a running set of text files. When you download a new installer for something else, all you're doing is downloading a bunch of text files. But developers need a tool to store all this code. So that's what we call source control management. There's a lot of different tools that exist. And as you can see, the market on the bottom right over here, the market is consolidating on Git. Git is different than GitLab. What Git is, is it's free and open source. And what other people do is because it's free and open source, they take it and then they add on features to it. And so that is both what GitLab and GitHub is, is that they took Git as an underlying engine and then they added on additional things and then we repackage it and sell that. So that's how people make money off of open source software like Git. Let's talk now about like what the life is like as a developer. Um, so we have sales quarters here, right? You have a quota at the end. And in the beginning, you may be doing, um, you know, what you're doing each month is different depending on where you are in that quarter. Um, and it's the same thing for engineers. Another thing that I really want to point out to is just like how there's goals and the pressure builds until the quarter is over. And then it's just almost like you have to gather your breath and, you know, breathe a sigh of relief. It's very similar to how engineers actually operate. We don't have a quarterly system. We have this thing called a release system. And um, and basically what a release is, is a big project. So let's actually just go through the phases. Um, but the first phase is that it's a planning phase, right? So you have all of these product managers, they scope out all of the work. They say, hey, in this next version, like, you know, version 1.2.3, of our website, we want A, B, and C implemented, X, Y, and Z. And the reason why is because, you know, like Apple Corp and this other company, they want it. And we think that they're gonna give us $2 million if we build this thing out. So their product managers determine what's important. And then the work gets assigned to engineers. After, so that's stage one. Stage two in the development cycle, this, this is also called like the software um, development cycle, is that, um, developers, they work on implementing this. So they have to build out this new stuff. So if a customer wants to see something, they have to make it work. After that, there's these engineers that are called quality assurance, and they make sure that it works fundamentally. And then the last thing that happens is that there's a release team that makes the next version of your software available. And so this is a really big event. After this happens, then people basically like they can all breathe a sigh of relief. Um, 
And one thing that I want to like point to with this is that the amount of stress in among engineering teams, it basically just ratchets up as you get closer and closer to your release date because the vast majority of engineering projects are late and we'll take, we'll see some data on that. Let's talk about how this actually works from a GitLab point of view. So you have these guys called project managers. They determine the work that's involved. And then after they've created the work that's involved, they'll create these things called issues, right? And so an issue is an individual unit of work. If we go over here into um, the GitLab issue board, then there's all of these things that like people are asking for. So it could be update this chart, could be create some sort of new thing, and then people are collaborating on the best way to do this. So what fundamentally, fundamentally engineers get assigned issues. Um, let me actually just go back to here. So as you can see, there's this person called Darva. Darva is responsible for implementing this one issue. This is how they get credit and this is how they get paid. Um, so management, then they assign the issues. They say, Sally, you get three, Chris, you get two. And then ultimately now the developers, they start working on these issues and they have to update code to basically solve it. QA, they test it. And then your release engineers release a new version of this application. Before I dive into this, I just want to show you how this works from a GitLab perspective. So we've talked about how, um, you know, step one is that issues are created, then collaboration happens. And we also talked about how fundamentally all software is, is just a running set of text files. And so how I hand in my work as an engineer or a developer is that I modify these text files. That's literally all I'm doing. I'm getting, these engineers get paid like X amount of money to fundamentally just change text files, right? So what are the changes that this guy's making? Well, what he's doing here is he's taking up this green text and then he's adding in this red text, this, uh, or excuse me, he's taking up this red text and he's adding in this green text and so on and so forth. So this is basically what developers do all day is modify text files, just like how like an editor is looking at books and just trying to like, um, you know, make them sound better and stuff like that. These developers are writing a novel in terms of software and as opposed to just like a story and a narrative, then it's all functional, right? So it's fundamentally trying to create something. And in this particular instance, it's creating GitLab. So uh, they hand in all of their code. It's fundamentally just these changes to this text file. And um, so then in this merge request, collaboration happens, right? So people go back and forth on, hey, is this the best way to do it? Um, you know, like, I, I don't like the fact that it's, you know, you did it this way, you should do it this other way. And then people go back and forth. So this is how collaboration happens in terms of GitLab. And ultimately, once the code is submitted and those text files are changed, then those original issues are closed. And now the developer can say to his manager, I'm done, give me my credit, like I'm gonna go home and I deserve X, Y, Z bonus. So that's really important for people to understand. From an engineering point of view, I'm not gonna dive super into this. The next class talks about how this works. Um, but there's this thing called branching and commits. If you take uh, 210, then we'll talk about what that means. Um, but this one chart is super, super, super important to understand. So we talked about what they, what engineers do. We talked about some of the emotions behind it. And this really just reiterates why people feel the way that they do. So this isn't just the developers. This is the managers. This is the directors, right? So in 2017, there's a report by the Project Management Institute. It determined, it, it, after you know, doing a meta-analysis, what it found is that 17% of IT projects fail. And you think to yourself, or not 17%, 14%. 14% is not that large, right? However, what they found is that this only represents part of the total failures of the projects that didn't fail outright. 31% didn't meet what they set out to do originally. 43% were over budget and 49% of these projects were late. And so when we talk to these managers and these directors, and even if we're talking to architects, 
it's important to understand that they're under pressure. And like one of the things that I always tell people is that almost everyone needs GitLab because this isn't some sort of niche problem. Engineering teams being late on their projects and failing in some regard is the rule, not the exception. And so when you go into these conversations and you ask how, you know, like what sort of bottlenecks do you have in your organization? They can tell you bottlenecks. And there's definitely things that they're concerned about. Why? Because if the average engineering manager is late 49% of the time, that means that a huge chunk of them, they're having those conversations with their direct reports and their direct reports are asking them about why their projects are consistently late. Um, so we can leverage this. We can go in, have these conversations. Tell me about your team. Tell me about your DevOps processes. What are some of your bottlenecks? Um, you know, I'd love to be able to help explore, you know, how to speed this up for you. These are things that trigger their emotions because no one wants to be late and be failing on their projects consistently, right? So it's definitely something that hits home. All right, so now that we talked about the emotions behind it, I explained the why, just to recap, what's this all about? This is about digital businesses. To get a digital business to run, you need developers. Developers, what they do is they develop the best software. Businesses care about having developers and giving them tools fundamentally because they want their businesses to run. When we talk to these audiences, most of them are behind and we can help a lot of these people. I really try to have an empathetic approach to all the customers that I talk to because I've been on that side of the equation. I'm just gonna go back and talk a little bit about my story as an engineer, is that I worked for Red Hat and honestly speaking, our stuff was some of the best in industry. Like in terms of our development practices and the talent that we hired, it was really, really, really good. That being said, we had extreme, on my team, we had around 80% turnover over a three year time period, just because of how much emotions and churn this release cycle took up. So as you can see, um, I was a test engineer. My job was to validate software for functionality. What happened all the time is that developers were always late, but the project deadline would never get pushed back because managers don't wanna look bad. So that means that the test team would get crunched and they say, as opposed to you having a month to validate all this stuff, too bad. The developers were two, two weeks late, which means that you only have two weeks to validate all this stuff. And so all the test people, they'd have to work late. They're all stressed out. The test manager is stressed out. And this happened probably, I'd say, two thirds of the time in my engineering group. Um, so once again, just a story to bring things home. We can help people to not have to work late at night and for managers to be able to systematically deliver better products for their end stakeholders and their customers through the power of automation in GitLab. Um, so that's, that's uh, you know, that's, that's the power of GitLab. All right, so now that we talked about applications and sort of talked, a, you know, recapped a bit, we gotta talk about how these applications are actually running, right? So they are a running set of text files, but they need to run somewhere, right? Like, um, and the machines that these text files run in are these things called servers. And so this thing's called a server rack. Each of these rectangular things is a server. So in this picture, there's five different racks and each of these racks, you can see around 20 different servers and each of these servers costs like over a thousand dollars and they're just stacked up on top of each other. So it's important to understand that this is the backbone of the internet. If you wanna know what the internet looks like, this is what the internet looks like. It's just machines that are running, you know, like sending data all over the place. Um, in terms of what Netflix looks like, what Google looks like, what you wanna do is they have these buildings called data centers. They're all over the entire planet. And then ultimately, once you went into these data centers, you would see these running machines, that's where all the magic happens. That's where these text files are running. Tell me about this picture. So this is a new data center. What are some of the things that you observe about this picture? No windows. <laughs> Very good. What else? Is it inviting? Not at all. It Why do you think that's the case? Uh, misleading to mislead people into what it is. It looks almost like a construction site. 
Yeah, that's very good. Um, tell me about its color scheme. What what color what colors are on this uh you know this warehouse? It's like a periwinkle. <laughs> and a gray. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, and let's talk about why, right? So if you're Amazon.com, you're on this great growth trajectory. And if you have some sort of big security problem where people break into the building and steal customer data, how much does that affect your digital business? Well, it affects it more than 10%. And when your revenue is $400 billion, 10% is $40 billion. So every single detail in this building is meticulously crafted. Uh, there's no windows to even get into most data centers. You have to go through three layers of security. So we're talking about like you walk into these chambers, they scan your eyes, they fingerprint you. That makes you go through like, you know, layer one. Then they show your badge and then you have voice recognition. And then they like pat you down to make sure that like you don't have any embedded devices and stuff like that on. And then that's tier two. And then take to get into a Google data warehouse, you have to go through literally three layers of security. Um, now, the natural question is that, is that necessary? And the answer is that if once, if Google had like any sort of vulnerability in terms of their data sovereignty at all, how much money does that impact their business? Well, it's billions of dollars, right? So that's why they put so much effort into making sure that these buildings are, um, as secure and uninviting as possible. They don't really don't they don't really want you to know that this building is here. And they usually like have them in obscure locations. We gotta talk about speed here. This is the United States. I know that we have several people from EMEA, but the same thing applies in Europe. Um, but you have data centers all over the country. And the reason why is let's just say I'm in Seattle and I'm visiting some website that's based out of Austin, Austin Texas. So if all of my servers are in Austin, then my computer sends a signal to Austin, takes one second, that computer to think, and then it sends a signal back, takes one second. So total amount of time might be two and a half seconds. But as we've already seen, two and a half seconds is gonna lose you 50% of your web traffic. So that just fundamentally means that any sort of e-business in Austin is only gonna be servicing really effectively a population around like, you know, a thousand mile radius, right? And then so what Google and Amazon and Netflix, they're smart. And what they realize is that I have to serve the entire country really, really well. Uh, and so what I need to do is I need to have data centers all over the place. And so Netflix will have a data center in Seattle, a couple in Portland, a couple in Eugene, set many in California, all over the place. And the whole idea is I want the fastest possible web service. My web service is the fastest. Then I have a competitive advantage. So like YouTube versus like um, Netflix or something, if one's really slow, then the other person's gonna get all of the, you know, the customers given a long enough period of time. And once again, this is just all an engineering problem. This is engineers going into rooms and figuring out the best way to do this. Cloud computing, uh, who wants to give me a summary of cloud computing? All right, I'll, I'll dive right into cloud computing. Um, so I uh, let's just talk about this from like, a, can you see my screen? It should be like a drawing thing. I was just gonna say it's pulling from different servers. <laughs> but yes, we can see it. Yeah. Um, so here's the story of cloud computing. So a traditional e-business, um, then on the bottom's time, on the y-axis is number of servers. And then, so let's just say that this is a calendar. So January, February, June, July, November, December. Let's just say that there's traditional, you know, e-commerce place. Let's just say it's Amazon. Um, and this is the number of computers that they need to keep their web service running. So in January, everyone's cold. So people are on their site buying a lot of stuff. Spring comes around, people want to go outside traffic goes down. Summer, you have more traffic because people are, are just stuck at home because it's too hot. Back to school day in the United States, you have a big spike. And then towards Christmas, you have like a huge spike, right? So in a traditional 
like the first paradigm that we had for computing is you have some sort of website. That means go buy some servers, install your web application on these servers that are now running your website. And that's how you basically do things. So everyone owned their, all, their own hardware. But the big problem with this is that over here, let's just say that this is Amazon. If we, if our analysts expect this amount of web traffic in the November and December timeframe, then we got to build ourselves some buffer in case these guys are wrong. So we're going to get a little bit more than that. And the problem with this is that for the vast majority of the year, all of this capacity is just computers that are sitting around not doing anything. And um, literally like they're not making me any money. It's just like a sunk cost and I don't really need them, right? So what the cloud is, is as opposed to me owning my own hardware, I can now rent someone else's hardware and pay them on an hourly basis. And so, you know, with the advent of cloud computing, what we could do is we could say, I only want this amount of capacity and I'm going to rent out this capacity and this capacity from the cloud to supplement my server fleet during periods of time of peak utilization. And so that is what the public cloud is for. So just to recap, traditionally, people own their own stuff. The limitations of that is that you have sunk costs for periods of time in which you don't have peak usage. But with the public cloud now, you can just rent servers and pay someone on an hourly basis for these servers and ultimately, a lot of times, save you some money. Um, so this is a huge deal. Um, GitLab this year is going to make probably around like $150 million. There was recently one deal for the US government that was $10 billion for uh, cloud computing and Microsoft won that deal. So um, we're talking about a huge market that's expanding. Over here in the right, here's the market share by um, cloud provider. You can see that Amazon's in number one, Microsoft's in number two, Google's in number three. The reason why Amazon is number one is because they had first movers advantage. They were the first people to do it and to do it well. And um, because of that, they their service offering is more comprehensive than a lot of other people. What we also see is that there's a huge consolidation in the market. So it's kind of like uh, economies of scale. If I have a lot of this stuff, then I can do it more cheaply than other people, which means I can squeeze out the smaller guys. Ultimately, what a lot of people are doing is they're auto scaling applications. What that means is that I'm just going to go scale up and scale down the number of servers that I have, depending on my utilization through the public cloud. And that was a lot of terms. Basically, the whole idea is as opposed to owning my own servers, I'm just going to continually rent them. And then when I rent them, then, you know, I'm only paying for what I use. And so um, that's becoming more common now too. All right, uh, so we gotta talk about virtualization containers and Kubernetes. So it's gonna get a little bit more technical. Um, stay with me here because this is gonna be something that's important to understand. All right, so there's this thing called virtualization and what virtualization allows you to do is to get multiple machines inside of one physical machine. Um, so I could have one server that has like five different virtual servers running inside of it. Let me show you an example of this. Um, let me know when you can see my desktop again. It should be the same one with the black box over here in it. Yep. All right. So this is my Mac, um, but over here, you can see that I have this thing called VirtualBox running. And um, even though I'm running Mac OS, I have a Linux virtual machine running on my, 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 um, my Mac. So over here's the login screen. I'm not gonna go into it because sometimes my computer gets upset with me, but like this is a Linux virtual machine that's running on my Mac. I could have on my Mac five virtual machines that are running at the same time. I could have one being Windows, one being Linux, 
three of them being Mac, I can really do whatever I want with them. But this was a really big deal um, when people invented virtualization. And the reason why is because, I need to find the right tab. Excuse me, I have like too many windows all over the place. All right. Okay. Um, so the reason why is because, let's just say I'm a small company and in general, like you only want to install one application on any server. That's just like an engineering best practice. Stuff gets really confusing if you install a lot of applications on the same server. But the problem is that each one of these servers cost me like, you know, $4,000 or something. And what if the application that I want running on it's really, really small, only uses 2% of the server. Well, then having the ability to split the server into 10 servers using virtualization is a really great use case for that. Um, so that was the original reason why they created virtualization is so that they can compartmentalize these servers and get more utilization out of them. Once again, the, the rationale is that like, in general, how these applications work is one application per server. If you have multiple applications on a server, then generally really bad things happen. And virtualization was a way to solve this problem. Um, so nowadays, so one thing that's important to understand is that basically all applications are running as virtual machines. Amazon.com, YouTube, Netflix, they're running as virtual machines somewhere probably in the public cloud. Um, but you don't have to use the public cloud. If you want to have your own servers, then you're traditionally using something called VMware or Hyper-V. VMware is owned by Dell and Hyper-V is owned by Microsoft. All right, so now, now let's take things a little bit step further. Um, so there's these things called containers and Kubernetes. This is really, really important for us to understand because I'd say almost like 15, maybe 10 to 15% of our fundamental value proposition has to do with containers and Kubernetes. So we talked about the paradigm and the story of computing. First, people owned physical machines. There were limitations and it was expensive, slow and cumbersome, right? Then people came up with virtual machines that allowed me better granularity um, and more flexibility. And what we've seen in the last five years is basically version 2.0 of containers and a virtualization. And so the way to think about containers is it's basically better virtualization. It's way faster, it's way more efficient. Every business wants this because it can save them money. If you're building a website using containers, then it's gonna have competitive advantages in terms of speed versus other types of architecture. So the entire market is going from your regular virtual machines to containers, around 20% of the market right now, this is kind of like a wild guess, maybe 15 to 20% of all applications right now are running on containers. In the next five to 10 years, that will go to about 100%, unless there are specific reasons why something it can't be a container. But GitLab is in a really great position though, because we were built for containers and we already are where the market is going. That is really important to understand. Part of our value prop is that we are we have great integrations with Docker and Kubernetes. The market's going here. We're perfectly positioned to snatch up customers as they have this technical journey. All right, from a business perspective, why do people care? It's way faster, way more efficient. Fundamentally, what I'm doing is I'm, if I'm a business, I'm spending a ton of money on these servers, right? I can get more out of my servers if I use containers than if I use traditional virtual machines. So um, basically just like save a ton of money in terms of cost. All right, so we gotta talk about some of the tools that run these things. If I want one machine, so like um, going back to this, this, slide. This rectangular thing over here is one server. If I want containers to run on one machine, then that's what Docker is for. If I want 50 machines all running containers, then I need something that's sort of like 
oversees that entire process because now it's more complicated, right? And that is what Kubernetes is. Um, so just to rephrase, because I know there's a lot of terminology, Docker manages containers on one machine. If I want 50, 100, 1,000 machines running containers, then I need an additional management layer that's going to make sure that things make sense in my environment. And that's what Kubernetes is. GitLab works really, really, really well for both of these things. Um, and um, so that's really important to know. GKE, what we refer to, uh, uh, GitLab actually runs on GKE, but this is Google's cloud Kubernetes offering. So it's basically, we are paying Google money to use their Kubernetes cloud offering. Um, so let me share my screen with you real quick. Let me know when y'all can see my desktop again. That's working. All right, cool. So here is a, uh, so here's Docker. Right now, you can see nothing's running in Docker. But let's uh, let's actually do something, right? So just um, hit that real quick. You know, what did I do? I did this thing called a Docker start. And now, if I go to localhost 8080, I have a WordPress application that is just running on my Mac. And that literally took me like two seconds to spin up. So this is running in Docker. Docker is just a way of running applications. OK, so now we're going to talk about APIs in the programmable web. Everything's building on top of each other. Um, this is really important. To, understand so like um i know that jesse you're in europe but for my EMEA crowd do you all use this restaurant review website called yelp have you ever heard of yelp before nope okay yeah, yeah. definitely do you all use like google reviews then in europe or what i've, I've heard of it okay cool so this is like a restaurant review website. Um, and, you know, so this is a really popular website in the United States. But as you can see over here, if I scroll down, what we actually find is that there's Google Maps that's somehow embedded in Yelp. And so, you know, for the untrained eye, you just might think like, who cares? But, you know, like one, are they just like, is this copyright infringement? Did they steal Google Maps's like data or like how does this even work from an engineering perspective? And how this actually works is that there are APIs talking to each other behind the scenes. And Google has actually allowed Yelp access to this data. If we scroll, scroll over here, we can see how much money they get, right? So the pricing for Google Maps for a static map, every thousand times this is displayed, Yelp has to give Google Maps $2. If they want the more dynamic and interactive maps, this costs $7 per 1,000 requests. And so this is the commercialization of data that happens today in technology. You have companies like Google, they invest millions, like hundreds of millions of dollars to get your data. And the reason why is so that they can sell it to marketers, they can sell it to other people around the world, other web services, and that's how their business works. Um, and how all this stuff works behind the scenes is through these things called APIs. And so um, let me just uh, pull up. So this is the handbook site over here, right? Um, www.gitlab.com. And one of the things to point out is that even though this is GitLab, we have an equivalent version of this which is actually the API endpoint that corresponds to this site. And so let me just show you that this blob of text is actually the exact same information as this. So over here, there's ID 7764. 
ID is 7764, right? And then the description is source for about.gitlab.com. This repo project is for the public facing marketing website for GitLab, blah, blah, blah. And then that's what it says here. Description, source for about.gitlab.com. This repo project is the public facing marketing website for GitLab. So why is this important? This is important because ultimately, if you're an e-business, then having the ability for other people to integrate with you is part of how you increase your visibility on the internet. Every time there's Yelp, there's a Google Maps embedded in another website, then one, you get money directly, right? But two, it's increasing visibility of your web service. More people know about Google Maps and the un underlying machinery that allows all of this stuff to work is APIs. Um, and once again, APIs is just an alternative version of your website. So as opposed to www.gitlab.com, we have, um, you know, API slash V4 slash projects slash 7764 says the exact same information as this. And this is what allows people to integrate with different web services. Whenever we talk about ServiceNow integration, our Jenkins integration, our um, Jira integration, how this works is that we have an API. If a customer ever asks you, can I integrate X, Y, and Z with GitLab? The answer is yes, because we have an API. Some of the integrations are better than others, but it always, Pretty much like 100% of the time, the answer is yes, because we have built out this API. All right, so let's bring it all home. Um, to recap, um, yeah, so it's a technology race. And the problem with the race is that it's just getting faster and faster. Uh, I think that like 20 years ago, a politician could reasonably have good policy decisions in terms of managing how, how people talk on the internet and like things like the dark web and stuff like that. But at this point in time, technology is moving so quickly that our legal systems lacking behind, businesses are lacking behind. So it's a great place for innovation. If you can take advantage of that and build a business out of it, you can make tons and tons of money. But the big problem with it is that it's changing so quickly that it's somewhat unmanageable at this point. Um, that's just the reality of the world that we're in. From an engineering point of view, bringing this back to sales and the conversations that we're having with our customers, I kind of want to just like also give a story. So I have a friend who just finished graduate school two years in terms of a nurse practitioner program. And, um, you know, so she would spend 300 hours studying the digestive system, then 400 hours studying the neural system. But when she's done with that two-year program, she doesn't have to, she needs to learn new trends and stuff like that, but fundamentally all of her education is done, right? The problem with your technology is that it is just as complicated as that, but in three years, it's going to be completely different. So that's a ton of pressure on the engineers, the managers, the directors, because they want to have a competitive web service because they want their business to be successful. Um, and the fact that all of this is changing so quickly just means that they feel behind all of the time, right? So there's a struggle to keep up the latest trends. They're constantly looking at their competitors in terms of the features that they're building out. In terms of user experience, if you, Amazon's done all of these studies on psychology and sociology and anthropology and all this other stuff, but tastes and you know what counts as like a fun interactive experience web experience is going to be completely different in six months right and so engineers now have to go make out that latest version of that website in terms of speed and security security is the one that i really want to harp on your website if it's completely a hundred percent locked down today is going to be out of date in a week um and if you're google or amazon and if you just have one major security vulnerability then how that that's going to be a huge disaster for your business um so most technology companies feel behind and you can ask them about this you can be like um and sometimes they may not be aware but i think that most people this is a very emotional thing for them just because if you're at the vp level or higher then like you obviously like 
identify with the organization that you lead. So how can we help, right? GitLab allows for organizational transformation so that people can get ahead. And that's a breath of fresh air for a lot of the people that we talk to. I think that it takes sometimes, you know, it takes some education for people to understand the value of GitLab, but once they get it, then they understand that this could actually be one of their linchpin lynch, lynch sources of organizational success so that they can actually not be late on these projects time and in time out and things like that. How do we do that? This is what we call command of the message, um, become more efficient, deliver better products faster and reduce security risk. Um, we don't go into that in this session, but uh, if you take Tanuki Tech 210 and 211, we'll talk about exactly how we deliver this for customers. Um, so yeah, that's the session for today. Uh, can I, I know that that was a ton of information. Can I clear up anything for anyone? I know that we sort of like talked about a lot of different technical things really quickly, but I'm interested in hearing what you, what y'all think and um, if I can uh, clear anything up for anyone. I've been taking notes, but will these slides be available? These slides will be available and I will also share a Google Doc with you. Um, this is how uh, y'all get credit for this course is by filling out the Google Doc. There's some questions at the end. And just one other thing, what does API stand for again? It stands for, um, I actually don't know. <laughs> That's what Google's for. <laughs> Uh, it stands for Application Programming Interface. This was super helpful. Thank you so much. I'm glad to help. Yeah, this is really fast. Chris. Cool. Awesome. Um, yeah, so let me talk about what I owe y'all from here on out. So. Um, Thanks for attending the session today. I really, at the end of this week, there'll be a survey that goes out. Feel free to let me know if there's anything that I can improve on. But um, filling out, I'm gonna, at the end of this session, there's two things that are gonna happen. One is I'll share the slides with y'all. And two is I will share a Google Doc with y'all. Um, and filling out this Google Doc is gonna be how y'all get credit for this course. I don't do this so that like I give you like busy work. Um, but this is really to help y'all understand like what each of these things mean, because um, I just really wanna see if I can help in terms of like our customer conversations. So every one of these questions here is something that a customer could ask you. Um, it's not busy work. Uh, I really do believe that it'll help everyone understand the concepts that are here. So um, what can y'all, what do y'all think about committing to having this done by Friday of this week? Is that fair? I think it would take maybe around 30 minutes. Yeah. That's good. It's fresh in our minds anyway. Mm -hmm. Okay. Awesome. Well, uh, thank you all for y'all's time today. I'm looking forward to seeing everyone in a future session. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Bye -bye. See ya. Bye. Yep.